For 60 years now, as you heard, I've been involved in editing a yearbook of Muslims in Europe. This has provided an opportunity to obtain a bird's eye view of the subject in a way which is often difficult, as much of the published research has a more local focus. And even where it looks beyond a single or a few countries, and often these are the usual suspects, France, Germany, the Netherlands, UK, with occasionally other smaller countries included, there remain countries which are seriously under-researched, not least those of Eastern Europe, which were formerly part of the Soviet system. One of the features which emerges from such a bird's eye view is the broad range of degrees of participation in Islamic organizations and their activities and of identification with Islam. This raises a very fundamental question of who or what is a Muslim in the European context. Traditionally, research in this field has started from the assumption that populations which can be identified historically as Muslim are assumed to be Muslim. This is most obvious in the attempts to put numbers on the Muslim populations of Europe. It's clear that substantial proportions of those communities which are lumped together as Muslim when the topic is approached statistically have a sometimes very uncertain relationship to Islam or at least to the socio-political category Muslim. Some refute any public identification with Islam at all, and a few publicly attack Islam and fellow Muslims. You can name people like Salman Rusti or Aisha Ayan Hishi Ali, uh, Muslims who attack Islam. In the broad middle of the spectrum are many who will personally and or privately identify themselves with Islam in some form or other, but refuse to have anything to do with any form of institutionalized Islam which may or may not include avoiding, for example, mosque attendance. Firstly, there's a problem simply of the statistical bases for such data. Most countries do not keep religious statistics. In some countries, especially in Eastern Europe, data are recorded on ethnic or national belonging, although the definition of that varies. In most Western European countries, the, statist the statistical base has usually been nationality, which was useful during the first phases of Muslim immigration, but gradually this has decreased in value as immigrants and their descendants become nationals of their new country of residence. But such an approach has the weakness that a nationality or ethnicity of origin is equated with Muslim, an approach which is unreliable, especially as regards countries of origins which have significant religious minorities. This applies most obviously to people from India, Lebanon, and Egypt. But even in overwhelmingly Muslim countries like Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, small Muslim, non-Muslim minorities still exist, and they are often overrepresented among the migrants. A further and more substantial flaw with these approaches is the assumption that all such Muslims are Muslim in the sense of having some form of relationship with the belief and practices of Islam, as distinct um, from others which scholars and media variously call practicing or canonical Muslims. Felice de Seto in Belgium refers to a few opinion polls which suggest that between a quarter and a third of Muslims are practicing. But even this is not very helpful as that can mean anything from someone who regularly even carefully observes the practices of the five pillars, the abadat of the textbooks of fiqh, and avoids alcohol and pork, to someone who only very occasionally, possibly at one or other of the main festivals, attends the mosque prayers and probably drinks alcohol but does not eat pork. A study done in Denmark of mosque organization and activity suggests that by the broadest assumptions, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of Muslims could be assumed to have some form of active relationship with Islam. But as the author herself suggests, at what point does a particular cultural practice with religious origins cease to be an indicator of religiosity? 
One need only refer to the various forms of European observance of Christmas to realize the problem with the Christian parallel. The solution of many commentators has been to attribute the term cultural Muslim to those who are regarded as not being practicing. In her paper for the first volume of the yearbook, my then PhD student, Nadia Yeltoft, suggested that by implication, Felicia de Seto's term attributed Muslim is appropriate. The standard assumptions about who is Muslim, especially for national statistics, are those which have been developed and imposed by the majority. Such assumptions are constantly negotiable. They have tended to have a strong ethnic context, content, so much so that some researchers talk now of an ethnicization of Islam, or in Britain, the term racialization of Islam is used. At the same time, another process has in recent years become a major factor both in research on Muslims in Europe and in the public discourse on the subject, namely security. In many parts of Europe, the congruence of non-European immigration and Muslim immigration, at least in the public awareness, is so strong that debates and policies concerning immigration and multiculturalism refer to Muslims and, all, and Islam almost exclusively. Muslims themselves, as well as Muslim organizations, have had to respond to such developments and have chosen different paths and thus contributed to the ongoing negotiations about assumptions. Thus, in the United Kingdom, the Muslim Council of Britain appeared in the mid to late 1990s with signals of government support as a preferred interlocutor. The rise of security concerns and especially tensions arising out of UK participation in the war in Iraq led to a cooling of relations following the Muslim Council of Britain's felt need to distance itself from the government. The expressed interest of the UK government in looking for partners in the Muslim communities to counteract violent extremism, especially after the London bombings of July 2005, accompanied by developments of ever more assertive security policies, have indicated a policy combining carrot and stick. By contrast, the Danish government between 2000 and 2010 was characterized by a very skeptical public attitude to working with Muslim organizations, driven particularly by the anti-Islamic views of the Danish People's Party, which though formally outside government, provided the minority coalition with its parliamentary majority. The practical interaction with Muslim organizations and more generally with ethnic minority organizations was focused at local government level and lower profiled contacts with particular agencies of the central government, notably the intelligence and security agency. In the Netherlands, the context has been sharply focused around the murder in Amsterdam in November 2004 of the fil film producer Theo van Gogh and the subsequent activities of the member of parliament Gerd Wilders in the light of the resulting domestic and international tensions, it's worth noting the warnings against an undifferentiated and careless response, both in terms of politi political discourse and in terms of security measures recommended more recently by the Dutch Security Service. If we look at the main Islamic movements or tendencies which can be identified across Europe, one feature is common. Where there is an official government-sponsored Islam on offer, it seems clear that that is the one which a plurality of Muslims attach themselves to. This is the case in those countries where this has been the traditional pattern, such as Turkey, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Romania, and the Baltic countries. A general pattern seems to emerge in those parts of Europe previously in or attached to the Soviet system. In the process, of establishing fascist and then communist state control over religions after the First World War and going on, forms of institutional recognition which were introduced, which at one and the same time contributed to the survival at least of the shell of Islamic structures, while also marginalizing and often driving underground forms of Islamic expression not useful to the regime. As also with the churches, significant historical places of worship were converted to museums and cultural heritage sites. 
The recognized leader is usually entitled Mufti, with the Mufti at as his for formal office, just as in the case of the patriarchs and the bishops of the churches, were granted strictly circumscribed public ceremonial roles in exchange for their support in controlling and suppressing undesirable, independently-minded religious trends. Often these leaders were suspected of, at the minimum, of cooperating with the security services. We know that some of the senior religious leaders of certainly of the churches in the Soviet Union itself were officers in the KGB. <clears throat> Since the collapse of the Soviet system, these traditional institutions have struggled to reorient themselves to a new environment. In the smaller countries such as the Baltics, as well as Romania, Hungary, and the Czech and Slovak republics, their function has continued with little change, providing a form of cultural support for a community which essentially had acquired informal status as ethnic minority. In Poland and the Baltics, talking about Tatars, elsewhere Kazakh, Turkish, Chechen, Azeri, and so on. However, the transition hasn't been without its conflicts. Especially in the former Yugoslav republics, a major question has been the extent to which the state-recognized Islamic organization should be independent of the old federal center of organized Islam here in Sarajevo. It has usually been possible to find an agreeable arrangement, although not in Serbia, where the Muftiate of Belgrade split. However, in most of these countries, a distinction has opened up between the historical institutions and communities and the newer communities arise, arising out of post-1990 immigration. The Eastern European countries were the destination for thousands of students during the Soviet period, from Muslim countries, especially in the Arab world, seeking university education, often with substantial support from the receiving countries. So long as the political system prevailed, they had no choice if they wished somehow to be involved in some form of Islamic expression, aids, informal marriage ceremonies, and so on. They had no choice but to locate themselves within the existing formal and informal networks. There was much confusion in the early post-Soviet years about the state of religious communities, other than those which already had some form of formal relationship with the state. In most countries, this applied to Islam, but Muslim movements such as Sufi orders, which might seek some public profile, had to wait, often until the end of the 1990s before the situation was clarified with not only new laws governing religious organizations, but also with the bureaucracies in place to implement them. Occasionally, some of those who had already settled and made do with the official structures until that point now took advantage of the new freedoms and either set up on their own or joined with new arrivals. Usually this led to the establishment of competing organizations claiming some form of better Islamic authority, but in fact more often representing different ethnic groups. Thus in Hungary, the oldest Islamic organization brings together, continues to bring together Hungarian Muslims, while two new registered ones are both partly Arab in nature. The appearance of new organizations with Arab character is something which is visible across the region, and many of these Arab organizations are often described by others as being Salafi in nature. Clearly, a sign significant dimension of the process of settlement is the European environment, which, in all its variety, has set constraints for forms of Islamic expression and institution building, and this is something that we could do separate conferences on. For the purpose of the current exercises, however, it makes more sense to look at patterns among Muslim trends for the, from the perspective of Islamicate criteria. Here it's clear that the term transnational is apt, at least in the sense that the trends in question cross national borders, even when they majoritatively can be traced to particular national origins. But in their origins, Many of them are, in fact, what one might call counter-national, in that the spur to their foundation was often a response against the imposition of some form of modern state structure, a nation-state, by external powers 
or in response to pressures from external powers. In the following discussion, I restrict myself to looking at the current situation, but there are different ways of approaching this. The most common remains to approach the various movements and trends from the point of view of their regions of origin. This leads to an, an, an analysis focused around movements of Turkish, South Asian, and Arab origins. Official Turkish Islam, that of the Diyanet, received a significant boost among European Turkish emigre communities after the military coup of September 1980 as part of a policy to reduce the dangers of the diaspora acting as a resource base for opposition movements at a time when the country had been close to civil war. In Germany especially, the local form of the Dianet, known by its initials as DITIB, expanded particularly at the expense of Suleymanji networks. For a time during the 90s, the more nationalist Mili Gorish experienced a marked advance and is still currently the largest of the networks outside the Dianet. In the meanwhile, however, domestic Turkish politics has seen a marked change with the growth of a series of political parties based on an Islamic foundation uh, have, have come to power and the old divides here between the Dianet and the Bili Gurush have become more vague. Islamic movements originating in South Asia are markedly the product of responses to European, in this case British, impact. The two movements will, which still dominate, the Brelwis and the Deobandis, arose as part of a revivalist response to the British abolition of the Mughal throne in 1858. The former, the Brelwis, of a distinctly popular Sufi character, while the Deobandis were rooted more in an approach based on textual learning focused on the core sources. Both founded a network of schools and seminaries of which the Deobandi network now spreads virtually worldwide, in the process having developed various tendencies ranging from a quiet spirituality to those underpinning the Taliban of today. The Tablir Jamad is an offshoot. Relations among these groups, especially the deobandi brauwi relationship, have from the beginning been conflictual, with regular outbreaks of what has been, outbreaks of what has been called fatwa wars. The deobandis have been called Wahhabis by their enemies, and the tensions continue to impact especially on Islam in the UK. The struggles leading to South Asian independence and the split of British India into India and Pakistan produced a new crop of movements, most prominently that of the jamaat e islami founded by Abu Ala Maududi as a political party in 1941. All of these and a number of smaller movements can be found where there are communities of South Asian origin. The Arab scene is dominated by the rivalry between Islamic movements, which in various ways have their roots in the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand, and structures which are effectively arms of government. Such is particularly the case among North Africans, where the Paris Mosque today, in effect, functions on behalf of the Algerian government, while the Union des Organisations Islamiques en France contests this official influence. But as with the Jamaat in the UK, the UEF cannot simply be equated with the Brotherhood, since it has regularly adapted and relocated itself in relation to the necessities of functioning in France. While such an ethno-national perspective continues to be a useful approach to map Muslims' organizational tendencies across Western Europe, it is not sufficient. Some groups have settled or inserted themselves unevenly in Europe and not necessarily accompanying the ethnic groups from which they are originate. Hezb al-Tahrir, forbidden in Germany, is particularly noticeable in the UK and Denmark, while the Pakistan-based Minhaj al-Qur'an has a history of public activism in Denmark and is growing in Britain. Other movements have extended, expanded beyond the ethno-cultural boundaries of their origins. This is most notably the case with Tablir al-Jamad, which originated in northern India, Pakistan, but has found followers among all ethnic groups and among converts. The case is similar with the various Salafi movements, which are finding support especially among the children of immigrants in Western Europe. They're also beginning to appear in Eastern Europe, 
mostly among converts and among recent immigrants from the Arab world. As a new European generation of Muslims has grown up, they have often become the drivers of development within the community and re in response to the surrounding national and international developments. Through the ease of travel, large numbers get access to experiences of other ways of thinking about Islam and of being Muslim than their parents had. Maintaining contacts with a family home or charitable or political engagement with regions of conflict can suggest options for a personal way forward through the conflicted space of identity formation. But it can be a dangerous path if the options suggested are among those on offer in regions subjected to war or violent instability. In extreme cases, visits to family in Pakistan, Algeria or Somalia have been the route through which individuals have been radicalized. However, it's important to note that radicalization is a small minority activity, although nonetheless dangerous for that. More common is the way in which the so-called Salafi tendencies have attracted especially younger educated people. <clears throat> Despite its modern origins associated with the reformist movements of Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Rida, more recently it has become more closely associated with the more puritanical forms of Islam often identified with the Wahhabi tendencies of Saudi Arabia. The tendency, at least as it manifests itself in Europe, focuses on study of Quran and Hadith and particularly encourages pious and correct personal behavior, emphasizing the Prophet as a model to be copied. Salafi mosques and study groups are attractive because they offer a supportive environment for young people who, theologically self-taught often, have become disenchanted with their parents' customs while finding insecurity and rejection in wider European society. Salafism, in one form or another, is often particularly attractive to young families who fear for their children's upbringing in an environment which they see as lacking coherent values and authority. Because of the way they dress, they often become the focus of, of attention when there's a terrorism scare. But all the evidence suggests that European Salafi groups abjure violence. In this, they have something in common with Hizb al-Tahrir, which otherwise bears little resemblance to the Salafiyah. The problem with both of these, as well as with other similar tendencies, is that they have a strong focus on what they see as the injustices of the politics of the Muslim world. It is therefore not surprising that they can function as feeder routes for individuals into the more radical activist groupings and occasionally slip over the line into violent um, into violent activism. On the other hand, the process of political engagement which may arise out of a growing identification with headline issues in the Muslim world can play an important integrative role when the issue in question is one which has activated broader sections of society as a whole. One very good example of this, both in the United States and in Europe, was the movement opposing the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Here, there has been a cause where often very angry Muslims have found common ground and shared in common political activity with a wide spectrum of trends in society as a whole. One needs to just look at the big February demonstration which brought together a million people in London, February 2003. Here they have discovered a route of integration and inclusion in the European space. I would suggest that similarly, the controversies provoked by the Muhammad cartoons in Denmark in Jyllandsposten a decade ago have encouraged an increase in cross-cultural and cross-religious activities in Denmark. This crisis may thus in the future also come to be seen, ironically, as an integrative event. Throughout these various developments, participation in the public space has become an essential tool of integration, and the very process of participation requires the development of mechanisms and forms of expression which can persuade the target audience, be it local or central government, or various civil society institutions. Equally, the process of participation itself 
favors those trends within the Muslim community which wish to move away from attitudes to, for example, social and human relations, which are commonly identified with culturally traditional Islam, and to which anti-Islam polemicists like to devote their undivided attention. This trend is reflected in a number of attempts to draw up general statements of Muslim principles in the European setting. When the Interfaith Network in the United Kingdom, an organization which has become a significant link between the many different faith communities and government, in 1991 published a statement on interreligious relations in Britain, it was intended as a set of principles to guide the attitude and behavior of the various religions towards each other and towards society as a whole. The statement was approved unanimously by the membership, which included major national Muslim organizations, including some of those which at the time were active in the campaign against the Satanic Verses and were later to form the Muslim Council of Britain. Three years later, the Paris Grand Mosque in a charter of the Muslim religion in France affirmed a commitment to a France based on a common citizenship, founded on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and on the Republican values. This was a more political document, reflecting the tensions in the wake of the Headscarves Affair, and at the time was widely criticized by other French Muslim organizations. However, later developments have, I would suggest, served to confirm its relevance, even if one doesn't openly refer to it. This first phase of such statements was motivated especially by the suspicions raised by the affairs of 1989-90, primarily Rushdie and Headscarves, regarding the ability of Muslims to integrate successfully, what a German scholar a decade before had called in a beautiful German word the questions of Muslims' Integrationsfähigkeit. Only the Germans can invent words like that. The more recent phase has clearly been driven by the need to respond to the events of 11 September 2001 and the increased impact of security considerations on, attitu on attitudes to Islam and Muslims. Already in February 2002, the Zentralrat Deutscher Muslime issued an Islamic charter which affirmed that Muslims living in the West should abide by the legal order guaranteed by the Constitution, that there is no contradiction between Islamic principles and human rights principles, and that Muslims must develop a European identity. In Britain, the 1990s had witnessed contested developments of national federations of Muslim organizations, among which the Muslim Council of Britain for a time was privileged by the government, but opposed by a network of organizations and individuals with strong commitments, particularly against the Middle East policies of the UK. But the aggravated security environment after the London terrorist attack of July 2005 added pressure on the various groups to develop some kind of common move towards common standards. Such statements arise in the given political context and often part of a response to particular political challenges. For that reason, they are easy to dismiss as being opportunist or manipulative but they reflect some deeper discussions which are taking place among European Muslims. Discussions which are extremely interesting, interesting indications of a possible convergence of thinking between the immigrated Islam of Western Europe and the long since integrated Islam of Southeastern Europe. These discussions focus on the nature and role of the Islamic Sharia, and I will just take two examples. Here in Sarajevo, with all due respect, Professor Fikhtar Kajic has talked of an exploration of the norms of the Sharia, stating that historically there is a detailed experience of the strictly legal aspects of Sharia as traditionally developed, functioning in partnership with legal rules and norms developed by government in the Ottoman Empire, the system known as Kanun. The basic criterion for the legitimacy of such a practice is the welfare of the community in general. Reviewing the spread of secular government in the 20th century and then the revival of interest in Sharia among Muslims in the last generation, he reflects on the situation of Muslims in secular states, states such as his own Bosnia and in minority situations. He considers Sharia 
in its traditionally developed form to consist of religion, ethical, and legal norms. As legal norms, the Sharia depends on the existence of an Islamic state. In a secular state, as in a minority situation, the Sharia can function for Muslims individually and collective as religious and ethical norms. I hope I've got that somewhere near right, Professor Fickler. Such an approach is echoed among some quarters among Muslim thinkers in France. I take as an example here Tariq Ubru, who is Imam of the main mosque in Bordeaux and a leading figure in the Union des Organisations Islamiques en France, which has its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood. He is active in a movement seeking to develop a Sharia for the minority, Fiqh al his perception of minority is not primarily quantitative, but an acknowledgement that the situation is, in Islamic terms, exceptional, and therefore requires an exceptional approach, accepting that the situation of being a minority in Europe is a permanent condition. Basing himself on the Islamic intellectual tradition, Ubru also reaches a conclusion which distinguishes the three facets of Sharia, the religious, the, ethic, the ethical, and the legal, where the legal is essentially laid aside. It has been suggested that since the project is primarily and religious and ethical, it is inappropriate to use the term fiqh, which would be a reasonable complaint were fiqh only translatable as law. However, its use in this context refers to the broader and deeper meaning of Islamic understanding and knowledge, of which law is but part. It is thus, like so many of the concepts being mobilized by younger Muslims in Europe, a revisiting of origins and a break with inherited traditions, and I would suggest that this might be one of the areas on which the Institute here could focus its research. Thank you very much.